That is John Sousa, and it is so nice to welcome you back here today in our new sanctuary. Welcome, John. And welcome to all of you. Welcome to the Boulder Valley Unitarian Universalist Fellowship on our first Sunday without reservations. So we're moving forward, kind of <laughs> getting through this pandemic together. <laughs> I'm the Reverend Lydia Ferrante Roseberry. I'm the minister of this beautiful congregation. And I'm joined today by service associate Mary Gibb and by John Sousa, who we just heard from. Amy Austin and Wendy Nelson are also providing music today. And our tech team, which is Deborah Mensch and Don Price. And for the first time today, Meridian Mensch. So I'm just delighted to have new people on sound. And thank you, Meridian. And of course, you are the ones that make this a beloved community. If you're here at the fellowship this morning, you may have noticed a packet of seeds on your chair. I got sunflowers, which are my absolute favorite. And here's a little message to, to match them. To plant a garden is to believe in tomorrow. Those are the words of Audrey Hepburn. The packet of flower seeds is a small token of spring possibilities from the grounds team, our volunteer group of members who oversee our landscaping year round. Remember, Margaret Atwood says, in the spring, at the end of the day, you should smell like dirt. So the grounds team wishes you a bright, warm, flowery, and beautiful spring. And if you want to come smell like dirt with some of your fellow congregants, you can sign up outside after the service. We ask everybody in this space not to connect on Zoom unless you are in this in live space, um, unless you're working for the tech team because it can mess up our, our uh, technology. Welcome, Zoomies. Yes. <laughs> As I say our welcome words today, I do invite those of you on Zoom to go into gallery mode and see who's amongst you out there in the Zoomiverse. And those of you here, just take a look around at this beautiful community, people you may recognize, people you haven't seen in a while, and completely new people. So look around and remember that you are all welcome here today. In all the beauty of languages, cultures, skin tones, shapes, and sizes that come together in your uniqueness, you are welcome here. In all the ways that you experience and express gender, you are welcome here. In the beauty that is who you love and how you love, you are welcome here. In all the ways you make your living and all the places you are from, you are welcome here. With all of the traditions that inform your spiritual life, you are welcome here. And no matter how long you are away, nor how soon until you return, you are welcome here. Whether you come with laughter in your heart today or you come filled with tears, you are welcome here. You are invited to join us with an open mind a loving heart and willing hands. We welcome you here today. Each week we acknowledge that the land surrounding us is the stolen territory of the Arapaho people and that many tribes roamed freely on this land for millennia before the arrival of white settlers. And we commit ourselves to being a center for spiritual exploration and justice making and to do the work of anti-oppression and, and anti-racism within and beyond our congregation. This month's Soul Matters theme is Awakening. And as you know, Earth Day is April 22nd, but this year we'll be dedicating the whole month of services to the Earth, awakening our minds and our senses to its beauty and its peril. And today we'll focus on the felt experience of the sentient world known as animism. If you're new here, we're glad you found us and hope that it, even in a virtual community, those of you who may be new online, you can experience the warmth and love of this congregation. Each Sunday is different here. Come on back a few times so you really get to know us. 
And those on Zoom can check out the links in the chat to help you get better connected. And anybody here can stop by the welcome table in the foyer after the service to help you get better connected. Finally, if there's any newcomers on Zoom, feel free to uh, just say hello in the chat. Let us know you're visiting. We'd love to know who's amongst us. And if anyone is a newcomer here, if it's, this is one of your first few visits and you'd like to do so, you can feel free to say, um, just stand up if you're comfortable doing so and say your name and where you live. That does help us get to know people. Stand up or raise your hand or whatever might work. Not required. <laughs> well, it is, it is very good to be together today. Everyone on Zoom can stay for virtual coffee hour, and roomies are welcome to stay and chat. And I believe I'm going to look for a hospitality person. Are we doing coffee outside today? Yes? Yes! Who knew that such small things would mean so much, right? It's a great reminder. If you have a chalice at home and you're a Zoomie, you can feel free to light that with me. And, light, and you can say in the chat, chalice lit in and where you are Zooming in from. Those of us here are invited to say the chalice lighting words along with me as Mary lights our chalice. We light this chalice for the warmth of love, the light of truth, and the energy of action. And now I'll sing our bowl again and invite you, inviting it to draw you deeper into the present moment and into the company of this expanding gathered community. Eyes. <laughs> I'm going to read a poem by Chellen Harkin. It's called The Worst Thing. The worst thing we ever did was put God in the sky, out of reach. Pulling the divinity from the leaf, sifting out the holy from our bones. Insisting God isn't bursting dazzlement. Through everything we've made a hard commitment to see as ordinary. Stripping the sacred from everywhere to put a cloud man elsewhere. Prying closeness from your heart. The worst thing we ever did was to take the dance and the song out of prayer, made it sit up straight and cross its legs, removed it of rejoicing, wiped clean its hip sway, its questions, its ecstatic yow, its tears. The worst thing we ever did is pretend that God isn't the easiest thing in this universe available to every soul in every breath. Thank you, that was beautiful. One of my favorite songs by Peter Mayer. When I was a kid, my family adopted their first and last dog, Rainy. He lived for 17 years. He was a little mix between a rat terrier and a boxer. A little strange, yeah. 
Indoors, he was as gentle a dog as he could be. But once he was outside on his own, away from home, he became a wild animal, running off on his own for hours, coming home only to collapse in a long nap. My mother fed him and cleaned up after him, and she talked to him quite a bit too. My brother and I were tasked with walking him, and we played with him when we had time. But who did he want to be with? Not any of his servants. When my father came in, exhausted from a long day at work, Rainy was waiting at the door. He sat patiently as my father ate dinner, and as soon as dinner was done, and Dad sat in his favorite chair to read the newspaper, the dog jumped in his lap. As my father stroked Rainey's soft ears, I could see them both relax into each other's warmth. Rainey knew who needed his affection most. A few years after Rainey passed on, my family spent, my family spent the summer at my parents' home. Since my father vociferously hated cats, we asked and were granted permission to bring our cat, Timothy. Timothy was very happy in the house and soon found his favorite companion, and you guessed it, it was my cat hater father. As soon as Dad sat down, the cat was in his lap, purring loudly, and my father learned to love the cat and was soon petting him to keep him purring contentedly. Once again, I could see the tension leave my stressed out father's body as he absorbed love and care from Timothy. 20 years later, a four-year-old lab border collie mix came into my life. His name was Chap. He was sitting in a parking lot next to the Humane Society's Adopt-a-Pet van. Just sitting calmly, taking in the traffic and the people walking by. I was one of those people. I put out my hand to him. He took a few snips. He took a two, took a few snips, and rubbed his head against my palm. As I talked to the volunteer nearby, Chap put his head against my leg and stared up at me with his big brown eyes. <laughs> I was smitten. Chap came home and we were bonded for the rest of his life. He was always beside me, tending me, making me laugh during sad times, forcing me to exercise, and urging me to wake up and go to sleep at the same time every day. He provided a warm welcome as, I, as he happily greeted me and rolled over for a belly rub when I came home from work. It is clear that all of these animal friends and their humans naturally experience nonverbal communication in the mysterious, unknown sea of awareness of other beings that we all float in. There are probably scientific and psychological explanations for all of this too, but they only prove that there are indeed unseen energies at work in the universe. The domesticated non-humans with whom we have relationships depend on us for their existence, free of hunger and discomfort, and most learn how to provide us with exactly what we need, whether it be warm affection or protection or just someone we can talk to who won't answer back judgmentally, in whose eyes we see understanding. And this carries over to all the beings that populate our environments. When we awaken to the realization that we are here to care for the natural world, not to dominate it for our own benefit, when we discover and dwell in our deep symbiotic relationships, as did 99.9% .9 of the humans before our era, we will discover who we are and begin to heal ourselves and the earth.
Each week we remind ourselves of the abundance of our lives and this community by giving half of our plate away to those organizations that share our values. Today we share our plate with the Wild Animals Sanctuary in Weld County, whose mission is to prevent and alleviate cruelty to animals by providing care and boarding in wide open spaces. They care for more than 650 lions, tigers, bears, and wolves in two Colorado and one Texas location. Every animal living at the sanctuary was rescued from an illegal or abusive situation. Their Keensburg, Colorado location has a mile and a half boardwalk for those who want to view and learn more about these animals. And if you haven't been, you really need to go. As our musical reflection begins, we invite you who are at home to write into the chat your answer to this question. What have you ex when have you experienced a special connection with non-humans? For the work of this fellowship, bringing love, reason, compassion, and justice to this world and to the wild animal sanctuary, 
we dedicate our offerings. I'm going to need my water. I have a few things to say about this this morning. <clears throat> a few weeks ago, I spent, I had the privilege of spending a morning at the meditation gardens of the self realization. Uh, Fellowship Shrine in Palisades Park, Palisades Park, uh, Pacific Palisades, sorry, California. Anybody been there before? Yeah, a few, maybe a few of you. Uh, my family was in Santa Monica for spring break, and I went alone that day because apparently no one else in my crew really wanted to become self-realized on this vacation. <laughs> but me, of course, the minister, I was like, I'll go. So, and you saw the photos, some of the photos that I took on that on that trip there. Have any of you ever had moments when you have been suddenly transported? As soon as I walked through the gates of this garden from the busy street that was really just yards away, I started to weep, literally. I started to weep. The space was vibrant with life. I immediately felt what I can def only describe as hyper-connected to everything around me in that space. I could particularly, I could practically see the spiral ferns growing and as I gazed upon them, the magnolias were blooming beautifully. There were huge redwood trees looming and they all surrounded this lake with lotus flowers, turtles, swans, and large koi. A short walk down a lush path with more hues of green than I have ever, ever seen in my life led to the outdoor golden lotus temple where a stone sarcophagus holds the only portion of Mahatma Gandhi's ashes that are outside of India. A short distance away was a, a, a um, statue at, at Krishna's waterfall, and the words of the Bhagavad Gita were inscribed on a wooden panel. The one who perceives me everywhere and beholds everything in me never loses sight of me, nor do I lose sight of them. And a little further down, nestled in some blooming orange clivia, some other uh, wooden plaque said, everything else can wait, but our search for God cannot wait. This quote is from Yogananda, the founder of the Self-Realization Temple who coincidentally, I just learned, came to the United States in 1920 and stayed here, but he came at the invitation of the American Unitarian Association, who had invited him to speak, to be the Indian delegate, to speak at their International Congress of Religious Liberals uh, that was convening that year. So we brought, we brought the first native Indian to this country to, and he had a vision that he was going to bring yoga and um, the Kriya yoga and Hinduism to this country. So we can thank ourselves for that. And, that, and he founded the Self-Realization Temple. The temple where I was at was founded in 1950s, but he did some other work further down the coast in Hollywood before that. But the plaques I saw, the plaques that spoke to, to um, everywhere, is God and searching for God. They connected my intellect to what I was already experiencing in my body in the gardens. Everything was holy there and obviously cared for with that kind of presence in mind. Now these gardens were clearly planned 
but not manicured for human enjoyment. Because later that afternoon, I went to the gardens at the Getty Villa, and they were classic gardens, created almost in the reverse form of what I experienced at the gardens of the Self-Realization Temple. Does that make sense? The classic gardens were created for humans to fit comfortably and be able to see over them at just the right length and sculptured, but the gardens here were created with the plants as central, as in relationship to the humans. Now, I've had experiences of profound connection in nature before, but almost exclusively in completely wild places, as I imagine some of you have, because I know there's a lot of hikers and people in here who, do, who are out in nature a lot. These experiences, when the aliveness and the animacy of creation is palpable, can feel like extraordinary moments to us living in these times. But according to Joshua Michael Shree, who's a teacher, writer, and creator of the podcast, The Emerald, animism is normative consciousness. That is, for 98% of human history, 99.9% .9 of our ancestors lived and breathed and interacted with a world that they experienced as animate as having a soul, a divine spark, the possibility of actual relationship with the rest of creation, of being sentient, of feeling. For most of humani humanity's experience in the long breath of humanity, it was just a felt experience, not a theory that was de debated by theologians. It was an ongoing discussion that took place with birds and streams and trees, most often without words. Shri's podcast explores the vast history of animism and its relatively short history as a forgotten part of human consciousness. So let's start with time. From the dawn of human consciousness until very recently, most of our ancestors just experienced animism as a part of their life, something they didn't even think about. The vast majority of humans lived in the Paleolithic era, which was about 200, uh, sorry, 25,000 years ago to about 10,000 BC, and it was known as the animate age. There was a very short period uh, at the dawn of agriculture and urban centers, which is about 3,000 BCE to about 500 years ago. That's a short period in people, in, you know, in world history. And that was the beginning of this dismantling of the animate. And you can see in early Greek writings dating to the 8th century BC, the first and foremost, they described an animate sentient world inhabited by forces that were experienced and named and honored over thousands of years. But in later writings, Shri says, you can hear the Greeks lament the loss of animacy and can see there were, in their words the shifts from an experience of animacy to, a, to moving the animate world into metaphor and myth, which is probably how many of us also may experience the world outside of us or animacy. The post-animate era, which is right now, the last 500 years, bitty bit of time in human history. We might call, or Shri calls, the age of dead matter. <laughs> Which I will say not surprisingly coincides with an era of unprecedented global destruction. Now if we look at the geographic scope of animacy, no culture other than the post-modern culture um, no culture didn't see a world alive with forces, infused with life, teeming with vibrancies that they were in relationship to. Japan, Easter Island, the Caribbean, animacy was experienced everywhere. The Tibetans have names for many gods, as do those in the Amazon Basin, the Jordan River, and the Congo. It's said that in Iceland, I think it's still close to 50% of the population believes in nymphs and um, the little, what are they called? Hmm? 
fairies, fairies and nymphs. So, so currently, there's a lot of people who have that. And it took seven pages for the Spanish explorer Ramon uh, Panay to list the names of all the classes of the animate beings that the Taino people of the Caribbean identified in plants and streams and stones. It is the vastness of this understanding of the world is hard to even fathom because we're living in this sliver of time. And you can see the similarities in these images, the way there's wavy serpent spirits of dominion in water from Africa to India to Vietnam to Australia. Now there wasn't even a word for animism until the 18th century CE. It came into common parlance by, um, by the founder of cultural anthropology, Edward Taylor, around the 1800s. And the definition he gave was animism is a mistake about the nature of the world in which people believe in souls or spirits or discourse about non-imperial beings. So it was defined and moved into our culture as a mistake. And even today, these definitions contain a circular error of inherent bias. The Oxford English Dictionary defines animism as an attribution of a soul to to, uh, to plants, inanimate objects, and natural phenomena. So animism is defined within animism. So it, 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 it means then that there's a pre-existing worldview that everything is assumed to be inanimate, and that then you have to attribute it. So it creates a, a, a belief system on top of what is considered a universal truth. Do you see that? Uh, Nurit David Bird, who's a professor of cultural anthropology at the University of Haifa, Israel, says, the entire, way, the entire way we relate to animism in the modern world is based on the insistence that the Western experience of the material world, uh, insistence that the, that the Western experience of the material world as inanimate entities is normative and mature. So you can see the hubris of this time in human history, this 500 years of human history, to say that everyone was categorically wrong, 60,000 years of aboriginal elders, all the Celtic seers of, and of, of the Druid lineage, all the Yoruba priestesses and Hmong ladies feeding the spirits, the Tongan shamans, the Pueblo turtle dancers, Homer, Virgil, and all the romantic poets, all the Brahmins in India, all the village spirit mediums, generation upon generation upon generation were all completely wrong. Could be. But what a loss to erase all of that with a word all of that experience that we could be having with a word, to downplay it, to just brush it off as something other than the aliveness that pulses in the world that maybe we actually can connect with because it is actually connecting with us. Luckily, animism has been kept alive mostly as a countercultural heretical view to the God in the sky and the inner materialism of our postmodern world. The transcendentalists within our Unitarian tradition were among those who taught, who sought to, to raise up this necessity of a direct connection to the sacred in nature and in relationships. Now, none of them would have called themselves animists but they did rebel against pulling, the pulling of God from a leaf, the way Ch uh, Chalyn Harkin says in her opening words. Here's Ralph Waldo Emerson in his essay, Nature, published in 1836. Standing bare on the ground, my head bathed by the blithe air and uplifted into infinite space all mean egoism vanishes. I become a transparent eyeball 
I am nothing. I see all. And the currents of the universal being circulate through me. I am part or particle of God. Modern animists, of which there are some, like who, who gather together as a group, you know, define animism as having three basic tenets. Everything is energy, and this energy is, sa sa I can never say this word, sentient. It is able to perceive or feel things. Everything has a divine purpose. All is essential, blessed, and beautiful. And what we do to ourselves, we do to each other. We're all part of the web of life. So you can even see threads of our Unitarian Universalism in this. And even, there's even a movement to change our first principle from the inherent worth and dignity of all people or all persons to the inherent worth and dignity of either all or all beings. So to really make that shift so we can expand our recognition of what is, has inherent worthiness. Animists believe that everything has a unique soul which is slightly different from pantheists. And they believe that everything shares the same spiritual essence and that God, they, sometimes in pantheism, you, God is everything. God is creation. And panentheists believe that God is everything in the universe and beyond, transcendent, pat, beyond that, more than creation. But honestly, these are all just words and they cannot capture the experience of relational aliveness that I and I hope some of you have experienced with the natural world or with your pets. Listening to that Emerald podcast that I was speaking about, I had a big yes. And it made me feel like maybe I fit into the world a little bit better. Maybe I was maybe a little less crazy that sometimes I can feel. So if you also are someone who's experienced that in nature, shouldn't we be talking about it as best we can? Shouldn't we be lifting it up so that when we are actually out in the world, we can begin to align our own values with our felt experience? I felt a sadness for all that has been lost to individuals and creation when we, in, in this relatively short span of time, have lost our connection to the aliveness and the, the interconnection with all of creation, instead turning it, it into a mechanistic object that we are here to control. In his 1991 book, the, In the Absence of the Sacred, Jewish writer and activist, Jerry Mander, that's really his name. <laughs> I swear, like that is like so, like, okay. Jerry Mander, he wrote, at the turn of the century, the car was portrayed as a harbinger of personal freedom and democracy, private transportation that was fast, clean, there was no mud or manure, and independent. But what if the public had also known about the negative properties of the car? What would have been the outcome? What if the public had been told that the car would contribute to cancer-causing air pollution, to noise, to solid waste problems, and to the rapid depletion of the world's resources? I'm going to add dependence on oil and the causing of many wars. What if the nation had been aware uh, uh, that we'd become a nation of private car owners that would require the virtual repaving of the entire landscape at public cost? We pay for these roads <laughs> so that eventually automobile sounds would be heard even in wilderness areas. I've always loved that quote. It really makes me think about our, some of the unintended consequences. And of course we can't know but I, but I think about, would we al have allowed this to happen if we'd experienced ourselves 
as, would we have allowed this to happen if we'd experienced ourselves as, oh my gosh, I can't read this, as more, <laughs> I'm gonna say this backwards, so I'm trying to say it forwards. We would only allow this to happen if we experienced ourselves as more worthy than the rest of creation. And that creation is not sentient and sacred. We would only allow this to happen if we made the worst mistake by putting God in the sky out of reach. In this congregation, we talk about being a center for spiritual exploration and justice making. Especially when it comes to the earth, we need to bring those two things together. We need to experience the sacred in the earth, the worthiness of the earth as we experience the worthiness of each individual so that our justice making for the earth comes from that place of deep love and longing. Over the course of the next month, we'll, we will meld spirituality and earth consciousness and create hope for our future as we engage in this time of spiritual awakening. And I hope you will join me in this conversation. Blessed be. Amen. Okay, so for only the second time in many years, you get to sing in the sanctuary today. So we are going to sing um, from the Teal Hymnal, number 1003. And not only do you get to sing, but you're gonna be fancy and do it in a round. So as you turn, you'll see that there are four lines here, but if you are a musician, or if you're not, you'll notice that there are repeat signs. So you're gonna sing every line through twice. We'll do that all together. And then Wendy is going to lead this side, and I'm going to lead this side, and we're gonna create that round, and we'll sing it all through again with each line being sung twice. All right, and we're gonna ask ourselves the question, where do we come from? Life is a riddle and a mystery Where do we come 
Now I invite us into our time of community connection, our time of sacred sharing with one another. If you're on Zoom and you'd like to share a joy or a concern, please type it in the chat window and then I will read it on my handy dandy phone here. And Mary will add a stone to the waters on your behalf. If you're in the sanctuary today, and I don't believe we have anyone in fellowship hall, is that accurate? Yeah, okay. Um, you can come up front, share your joy and concern using the microphone, and then add a stone into our sacred waters. Or you can always add a stone in silence or put a little something in the chat to that effect. And wherever you are, please tell us your name and where you live. That helps us follow up with you if you'd like follow up. So. And for a prayer, I share a, a poem from John Wellwood with all of you. It's entitled, Forget About Enlightenment. Sit down wherever you are and listen to the wind singing in your veins. Feel the love, the longing, the fear in your bones. Open your heart to who you are right now, not who you would like to be, not the saint you're striving to become, but the being right here before you inside you, around you. All of you is holy. You, all, you are already more and less than whatever you can know. Breathe out, touch in, let go. May each of you know how beautiful and sacred you are. Well, I just wanted to take a moment and say good morning to everyone and just it's such a pleasure to be back here sharing music in person and um, uh, Tad caught me just in time because I'm leaving for Europe in just over a week. So excited to be returning to Ireland and the Netherlands and France and Sweden for the first time for music and teaching. And I have a brand new CD out, a new album called From Above, and I have copies here with me today. And for this final piece that I'll share with you today, um, it's a tribute to one of my teachers and great musicians Pierre Ben Susan, the amazing French guitar player who happens to be in Colorado this week. He's performing in Longmont tonight, so I'm very excited to see him. And uh, thanks again for listening and thanks for having me. It's been a joy to be here today.
have a few announcements today before we extinguish our chalice. So, you all have already pledged 430, over $431,000 for next year's operating budget. So that's amazing. This congregation is so generous. And, you know, it's like, the, it's, it's another modality of the caring that keeps us going here. But it's not quite at our goal of $472,000. So we'll be doing a one-time extra appeal on Easter Sunday. And I'm really happy to announce that we have a generous anonymous donor who has put $6,000 in for a matching grant on that Sunday. So if we can raise that, um, every dollar you offer will be um, doubled on that Sunday. And you can still pledge in the foyer today. And for those of you on Zoom, there's a link in the chat. Uh, the chat with the minister returns today. That's like an in-person chat that we used to do <laughs> with new members uh, to come and get to know me. So look for the person with the sign in the foyer and then we'll go into a quieter space after that. The adult uh, religious education uh, team is offering a book, Defund Fear. Safety Without Policing, Prisons, and Punishment. It is the UUA Common Read, and so we're gonna do it here in this congregation. It's a really important book to read in these times, really learning about alternatives to how we can move away from this incredible mass incarceration system we have that is racist in its origins. So um, there's a link in the chat for those of you in the chat, and otherwise you can go to the welcome table if you're here and you're interested in signing up. And this Friday night, the Jedi Speakers series will, series will be on Zoom from 5.30 to 8.30. Reverend Gordon Clay Bailey of the Las Vegas UU Congregation will be uh, shown on video, and then he's also the previous All Souls Unitarian Church uh, black minister and music director, and he was 17 years as a chaplain in Harlem Hospital. I've heard his talk and it's fabulous, so I really recommend going to the Jedi Speaker Series this Friday evening. And that chat is going into, that's going into the chat, and for those of you in the room, you can look on um, Connections Weekly if you get that, or go to the front and they'll get you signed up. And those are the announcements I have for today. So we will extinguish our chalice, but not the warmth of love, the light of truth, or the energy of action. These we carry in our hearts until we meet again. One more chance to sing today in the gray hymnal number 61, a beautiful hymn of spring, Lo, the earth awakes again. Many of you uh, with longtime Christian roots will probably uh, remember the tune to this. So if you would like, please stand as you're willing and able and let's sing, Lo, the earth awakens again. 61. Yeah. 